Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Surface Navy Association's 2020 National Symposium, the number one gathering of U.S. Navy Surface Force leaders from around the world. Our coverage here is sponsored by GE Marine and Leonardo DRS. And we're over here on the Austell USA stand to talk to uh, Larry Ryder, uh, retired United States Navy, uh, United States Marine Corps <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel. I was gonna, people were going to say, what, a Navy oh, yeah. Lieutenant Colonel? Uh, uh, who is a Senior Director for Business Development here uh, at the company. Uh, Larry, thanks for very much uh, for the time. Um, obviously, unmanned systems, very, very big focus priority. We heard the integrated force structure assessment. Uh, we heard a little bit from uh, Admiral Kilby, certainly heard about it from Admiral Black, the N96, talking about this integrated force. We were hearing that from Admiral Boxel uh, when he was in uh, 96 as well. Uh, you guys have been making a lot of investment, and there are a lot of folks who see that the size of ships you guys are building may be in that sweet spot of 250 foot, uh, certainly for low, uh, uh, large displacement unmanned uh, surface vehicle, but even for medium applications. Talk to us a little bit about the concept you're demonstrating here and how you guys are thinking about this space uh, as the Navy moves up the chain for, for unmanned and optionally manned vehicles. Great, thanks for coming over here, Vargo, and stopping by. The, uh, and yeah, autonomy is, is a big part of our future. The, uh, we think it's a big part of the Navy's future. The, uh, the fleet architecture studies from a few years ago and now the, uh, the funding lines to go with that have, have certainly come into play. Um, we think it's a good, good place for us. The size of the ships we build, as you mentioned, the, uh, the innovation we bring to the designs, the LCS was pretty innovative, the, uh, the EPF as well. We're doing the same thing with, um, with the unmanned uh, platforms we're developing. Our focus is, you know, from the keel up, what would an unmanned ship look like? What would an autonomous ship look like? What are the special design considerations? And, uh, you know, our goal is to provide the Navy, you know, those, those ships that are going to build a future unmanned fleet, integrate with the, uh, with the autonomy packages that are being developed by others. Um, and part of that is the, uh, the medium USV that uh, we've put a proposal in on. We think we've got a, um, a, an innovative design that meets the Navy's requirements for that one. Same with the large USV. Uh, we have developed designs that are monohulls, trimarans, catamarans, so we've looked at a wide variety and uh, we've matched those designs up with the Navy requirements and given them the uh, what we think is the optimal design. And, and what are some of those, um, and we're going to talk about your proposal in a second, but what are some of the unique design characteristics, right? Because there are those who say, look, you just take a surface ship and you adapt it, but actually it's radically different once you get the people uh, part of it out and you don't have to worry about it. Um, how, how does that change the kind of architecture that you guys are, are, are bringing to answering the problem? Yeah, so it really uh, changes the trade space that you use to build that platform and how you optimize that. Um, you, know, you really make trades based on reliability versus redundancy. You select different components, um, and, and it gives you opportunities to do different things with space that are normally reserved for, for hotel services, and uh, you take a different look at, at survivability, uh, like I said, redundancy, um, and you come up with different solutions. Uh, by taking an existing ship and modifying it, you know, the, the trade space you have left to work with is pretty limited on what changes you can make. Um, if you're starting from the ground up, or keel up in our case, the uh, you have a whole ship to work with and really re rethink how you would design it. Um, you know, right now with with the projects the Navy has out for bid, there's still manning required at some point. Right. So it is somewhat limiting what we can do, The um, and, and we've responded to that. Um, you know, where DARPA is going with their project, no Mars is clean sheet, if a person is never going to step foot on this ship, what it'll look like, and that's really exciting to us, because that's where we think you can really be innovative and you can provide optimal solutions. Um, let's talk a little bit uh, more specifically about your uh, medium uh, displacement uh, solution. Navy looking at the medium for the sensor grid right. part of it, uh, and the large for the magazine or the adjunct or the yeah. mated or paired or in transit pairing or whatever. Um, Talk a little bit about some of the specifics of your proposal, how you got to the form, the shape, looks cool, uh, got a great paint job, who doesn't like a dazzle paint job, I do. Uh, but you know, you guys have a little bit of very, very nuanced attributes to this, whether it's for signature reduction or otherwise. Talk to us about some of the foundational elements that went into that design. Yeah, so we started with a paint job. We wanted a cool paint job and we went from there. So, uh, no, and, and it is, in competition right now, so um, you're going to be a little bit. I'll be be a little bit cagey on it, but um, 
But like I said, we started um, prior to the requirements coming out and uh, looked at different hull forms and different sizes and displacements. Uh, once we got the requirements from the Navy, we you know we selected the uh, the best platform the uh, and, and tweaked it a little bit, obviously, to meet those requirements. Um, and like I said, you know, we, we, we made that trade space. You know, there, there is a manning requirement, so uh, we made some changes based on that. But uh, well, uh, you incorporated windows into it really elegantly, Larry. I got to tell uh, you, it, look, it looks it looks good. Cool stickers. It looks <laughs> those are cool stickers. No, yeah, uh, yeah. Not only do we build good it, it, it ships, actually, we got good stickers. It's something you look at is you know is it uh, you know there's different ways to deal with the pilot house requirement. Right. You know, is it a you know is it a modular piece or are you incorporate it into the ship? Do you have to have traffic lanes where people can move about the ship without going into the weather? You know, all those things were, um, and frankly, the way the requirement came out, we had to adapt our thinking to, you know, to what the Navy asked for. And, uh, you know, obviously we did that as best, you know, we, we think we gave them a good solution. Um, uh, two uh, updates. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about EPF. Uh, you guys have the medical variant. I believe you guys uh, were showing that also last year. Yes. Uh, but it's, it's something that a lot of folks are talking about, obviously, if you're going to go into a highly contested environment. And also some of the challenges associated with uh, comfort and mercy. Steam-powered ships takes a long time to get underway, uh, whereas folks are looking at something more agile and, of course, manning associated with, with such a gigantic ship. So talk to us a little bit. Bring us up to speed on where you are on both elements of the program. Right. So as far as the medical uh, concept ship we've talked about, you know, as you said, you're exactly right. The current hospital ship capability is, is, is slow and it, it is never going to be where you need it ready to, uh, to support the operating forces. So we've proposed something that's um, relatively inexpensive capability, uh, low manning, you know, the ships are highly automated. Um, so you can buy these ships in numbers so that they're forward based out in, you know, the Mediterranean CENTCOM, PACOM, close to the action. Um, when you need to operate them as a medical platform, you fly your crew, your medical detachments on board, travel at 40 knots. We are very close to having a uh, the certification to uh, to operate V-22s. So you take the speed of the, the medical platform and the, the range and speed of the V-22, and you've got a pretty good medevac capability. Um, do the you know do the initial trauma care, and then uh, you know you move the ships onward, or the 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 passenger of the uh, casualties onward and, and um, a stable and a stable platform for medical stable procedures platform obviously you know it, it we tweaked our EPF design a little bit to put more emphasis on on stability um, it's a slightly different uh, design than the EPF but uh, exactly so it, we, we think it's a, a new different way it, it meets the requirements of the distributed you know maritime operations and um, it really provides that capability to take care of the warfighter much more effectively and, and forward. Um, you, you can move these just about anywhere, and when they're not doing that mission, you know, they're doing the engagement mission much, you know, instead of the current hospital ships anchoring out and running, you know, boats in and out, you know, you can pull these into port and actually be there where you're uh, engaging with a, the population. So. And, and where are you on the EPF so uh, baseline is, program? Yeah, so this is a new model. This is a, a new concept that we've, uh, we're bringing out at, at this show for the first time. The um, it's a 113 meter, um, based obviously on the EPF, but it's a, uh, a design focused on expeditionary uh, support. Um, something smaller than the current amphibs, but uh, you know more agile, uh, more inexpensive than an amphib, but provides a lot of the capability of, uh, of what you need for a smaller expeditionary support platform. So it's obviously it has weapons on its self defense. It's got a two spot flight deck. Osprey capable, you still have the ability to launch and um, recover boats, a, a mission deck for rolling stock, so you can put combat units in uh, on board and, and move them around fairly quickly. It's more of a uh, more operational, more uh, slightly upgun DPF concept. And and, uh, and you guys think that's a little bit more in line with what the Commandant of the Marine Corps, exactly. General Berger, is talking we, about. We and that's why we rolled it out here because we've been looking at it for a while. And then the uh, when General Berger released his his guidance. You know, we, we think it's a good fit. And uh, how many uh, EPF uh, of uh, sort of the baseline version are you guys building now? What's the program of record? So there's 13 that will be the basic EPF. The 14 is going to have the enhanced medical capability. And 15, which is in the uh, the budget, you know, the, the FY20 budget isn't under contract yet, but uh, we expect that will be a continuation of 14. And uh, you guys are one of the two uh, LCS manufacturers. That program's winding down. You have a frigatized version uh, of the uh, Independence class. Uh, yeah. Is that 
program still on schedule? I mean, you hear rumors that it may be delayed, but actually everything we understand from Navy leadership is to try to accelerate it if at all possible. I mean, where do you guys stand on that right now in terms of the feedback you're getting? Which one, the frigate program? The frigate program. Yeah, so the frigate, you know, we've submitted our proposal. We, you know, as far as we know, the, the Navy's on track to make the award this summer as they've, they've announced. Um, we, we think we put a very competitive design, very cost effective and capable ship and uh, that meets the Navy's requirements. And, um, you know, at this point we're, we're waiting to see when the, uh, when the award comes out. The, uh, but we also have continued to work on the um, upgrading the lethality and survivability of the LCS ship. You, you, you're right, it's winding down, but uh, you know, there's still a large fleet. We're still building LCSs and, um, you know, we have the ability and we're working with the Navy to put more capability to bring it up, you know, to more frigate-like capability. And how many uh, left? I think it's like three or four left that you guys still have to build? Um, it's uh, four, I believe. It, okay. uh, I had that to think. I'm thanks sorry. very much, Craig, uh, for that. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, Larry, <laughs> thanks very much. Firm wins following seas. Best of luck. And of course, in the frigate competition, it's uh, Fin Contieri, GD, uh, Bath Ironworks, Huntington Ingalls uh, with their design, and then uh, you guys uh, with uh, General Dynamics as, as you guys work that. But Larry, best yeah. of luck on the program. Best of luck with all of these absolutely fascinating uh, concepts. And uh, look forward to uh, staying in touch. And uh, good luck also on the unmanned system. Thank you very much, Vago, and next year we'll have new models for us to talk about, <laughs> so I uh, appreciate you coming by. Thanks. It's still a great paint job. <laughs> it is a great paint job. <laughs> it's all about the paint job.